Jeff Chapman, what's up, man? Thanks for your time today. How's it going, my man? Good to see you, Matt. Good to see you, too. I haven't seen you in probably six months or so, man. We've yeah. met times, but I haven't seen you. Glad you're doing well. I see you got your beard shaved off. Finally yeah. Uh, I had that uh, that old mountain man look going on there for a little while. <laughs> so good. I've never had. I've never. I had a mustache back in the 90s, you know, but uh, 80s and 90s, but. You know, since I've been with the King of Merit, I've kind of been clean shaven. A lot of people like that. It's just one of the rules they had set, which is weird because back in the 90s, everybody, even the King of Marys, had mustaches and, and uh, you know, longer hair, party in the back. You know what I'm saying? Right. So. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, I got, it's a base thing, uh, sweatshirt on today. Oh, yeah. You got sweatshirts or hoodies like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's totally cool. I knew. I knew. The first time we did the the shirts, it was probably three, four years ago, man. It's been a long time. Yeah. I sent you one, man, and it looks so good. I think I even did it have your name on the back. Can't no, remember. it didn't. It no. didn't. Okay. No. I can't remember if we personalized it for you or not, but no. But man, I, you you did pretty good on them, didn't you? I it was yeah, it was all right. It, at the end of the day, it was just about keeping bass singers out there all up right. front. You know what I'm saying like. What's what's wild is I had uh, working here at Dollywood. You know, uh, you come out with the had the cleft note, you know, bass cleft note on it, and uh, it's all about the the cleft note, you know. Yeah. And I had it's a bass thing. I had most people were asking either it's is it a bass thing? Are you a fisherman? You know, or either I had a lot of uh, uh, guys that played the bass guitar and upright bass here at Dollywood. I had several guys wanting those shirts, so. As a matter of fact, I think you got me one of them for one guy yeah. uh, during quartet convention. He loved they wore that thing all the time. <laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> what in the, you know, this is bass singing central, what we're doing this right. video for. And um, the guys that come to this channel, I say it every video, but the guys that come to this channel are looking for bass singing tips, techniques, mm -hmm. um, just exercises stuff that is going to help them become better bass singers and we've talked right. to guys that are in the acapella music world the uh -huh. gospel world and and the choral guys you know yeah. guys just from all walks and every time i talk to a southern gospel guy that talks about what they call the mask technique that tim riley used and has shared with other bass singers mm -hmm. every we've talked to that says the guys that are using that technique today you are the man on that you have it down the best you are the one to go to for it so for those that are wanting some information that is a little bit more in depth on that technique why don't you give them a rundown on the technique that you were trained on and that you use well uh basically Back in the the late 80s and early 90s, I was just a teenage boy um, wanting to learn how to be a better bass singer. I knew I knew that there was a calling on my life uh, to sing gospel music. And, I, you know, I don't know that that I, 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 it's crazy because my daddy was a bass singer, too. So. Uh, the, the Chapman family had a group back in the 60s and 70s, and everybody in the family sung. I mean, uh, I don't know if they could read a note, but it was, you know, it was all just open up and let her fly, you know. And uh, so so when I, I was about, I was probably about 11 or 12 years old, my voice went from tenor to this. And... Uh, and even my son, he's 16 years old. He, oh, dad, you know, he's just got this, this low tone to his voice. And, yeah. and so it was kind of hard after the Chapman family broke up. Um, they were called the singing Chapman family. They were a, a regional group down in South Georgia. They sung all over Georgia and Florida and South Carolina. And, um, but there were several preachers in the group. So they disbanded to be more in their calling, you know, but as we got older as kids, um, my mom was a tremendous uh, soprano, and my dad was a pretty good bass singer. But it was all just kind of Ray Dean Reese, you know, that push it 
all uh, that way through your head tone, you know. And uh, so I, I picked up singing bass because Daddy preached most of the time, you know. So so for my brother, my sister, my mom, we we did a little mixed group, you know. And uh, for the longest time, I was singing tenor. I had to sing in between my mom and my brother. Because, and we do a lot of trio stuff. Daddy was singing the bass part. And uh, so I kind of I kind of uh, was pushed into that position because my sister is a great musician. Uh, she's a great piano player. About sit about, she can sit down and play just about anything. And, uh, but she didn't like to sing. She was really shy about that. So, so my brother, he's a singer. My mother's a singer. My daddy's a singer. And um, I'm a singer, so we even have a sewing machine that was a singer. <laughs> well, I had to throw that in there. It's just one of those stupid <laughs> things. <you know? laughs> but uh, no, when I, I, I mean, we went to the Waycross all night sing every year, and I'd see uh, JD, uh, Big Chief, and, and George Ots, and so many great bass singers. And, and I'd just sit there in awe. I, I thought JD looked like Frankenstein up there. You know, it's just, it was crazy to sit there and just watch them. And, uh, and so I grew up under the shelter of Southern gospel music and singing with my family and everything. And when I got older, I mean, I, I was probably about 16, no, 15 or 14 or 15. And I recorded, we had a little local group that we had as far as uh, me and uh, music director at my church, my brother and another guy that sung in the choir. And we had a quartet called the New Proclaimers. We had to put Neil on it because there was already a group in the region called the Proclaimers Quartet. So uh, it's, you know, it's the way it was. But anyway, so I recorded uh, Under Control in the same key that Tim Riley reported at the end of 14. So I knew I had something, but I didn't want to brag about it. I didn't want to, you know, try to, hey, everybody, I'm the best there is. You know, I never wanted to do that. Never wanted to come across that way. And, um, but it was a struggle to hit some of the low notes that Tim hit. So, uh, and I, I was a fan of Mike Holcomb and George Johnson and, and Tim Riley. And, and I felt that if I could combine all three of them, you know, I had Mike Holcomb that was just this big full voice, you know, and George could sing a solo better than any, any singer just about I've ever heard. I mean, it was amazing. Um, and then Tim just had that, that bite and clarity. The first time I heard uh, the Gold City Quartet live in Atlanta, I was I was just a teenager, and I went. He was doing "Oh What a Happy Time," and I'd hear him play a golden harp, you know. And I was like, "Oh my word, who is that?" And Mama said, "That's a new quartet called Gold City." I said, "I want to know who that guy is." So the first time I heard him, I just sit there and all oh, I could not believe. Yeah that how somebody could hit a note that sounded like a trombone or a tuba. You know, how do you make that, that blast that, that I'm trying to explain. Uh, I've talked with bass singers a lot of times. It's like a speaker. You got a woofer and you got a horn. Most of the time, bass singers sing from the woofer. There's no edge. There's no highs or mids on their voice. So, uh, growing up, you know, and I finally got, uh, I first started with my first group when I was 17, full-time group called the Bob Wills Family. And I traveled with them for uh, probably about eight or nine months, but they were gone all the time. And I was just a kid and wanted, I missed my family and everything. So I left them and came home for about a year and a half. And I joined a group called The Sound. And Bob Wills has a sister named Lou Hildreth that passed away this past year wonderful sweet lady and yeah. uh she called me and talked to me about joining the group called the sound mike presnell was leaving to go with uh start perfect heart with danny fun of her and uh so i was with scott fowler and frank Siemens and a guy named craig hodges and a piano player named steve woods and uh steve wood used to be with the anchorman so during the process of joining the the sound, I got to meet Terry Carter and all the anchormen and uh, traveled with Steve Woods. So it's kind of like I, I got to know the, the anchormen before I ever joined them. And uh, so I don't mean to go into all this, but my point is, while I was with the sound, I got to meet Tim Riley. 
at the music hall in Houston, Texas. And he was showing me some stuff that day that I'd never heard of. And uh, he said, son, you ever, you ever, uh, whenever you're sick, you know, and you sneeze, you feel like everything's up in here. You're kind of talking through your nose a little bit, you know, and I said, yeah. He said, you got to learn how to get that placement of that mask right in there, right in here. And a lot of people don't understand that. And basically what it's doing is like I went back and I told you about the speaker a while ago. Most bass singers sing out of the woofer. There's no edge. There's no cut. There's no quality on their voice. It's just whoa, a rumble. So uh, Tim taught me every time I was with him, we were with him a lot with the anchorman. And uh, he would, and I got his phone number. I would talk to him. He'd come into town and they said, I'm right over here. If you don't come pick me up, we'll go get some lunch or something, you know. And I would talk to him. I'd wear him out, condensing and everything. And it's the same technique that Leroy Abernathy taught so many bass singers. Big Chief, uh, J.D. Sumner, George Arts, Rex Nealon, all these bass singers. Because used to everybody sung around one microphone. And the bass singers, if you don't sing it correctly and you're not pushing it through this area here, you're not going to be heard over a, over a trio. Because yep. a trio, they're singing with point on their voices, you know, and getting that edge on there. But the bass singer is just, if he sings out of his throat, he's not going to be heard. So you had to learn how to project your voice. It's a lot like, uh, I think, um, my buddy uh, uh, with Signature Sound, Paul, he went through, um, he was taught voice uh, in opera. So, and it's the same technique. You're basically... You're trying to get your, when they say don't sing out of your throat, you're learning to put a point on your voice. So you're wanting to do like a horn type of thing to where it's projecting out. Now, you don't have to make all these silly faces and everything that most bass singers do to do it, but you do need to keep your smile up. Because if you can keep your smile up, you keep your, your, your sinuses are open and everything. And I do, I do little simple techniques when I get ready to sing every day. It's uh, I build up pressure like I'm gonna pop my ears, and I do like that. Build up pressure, and it actually brightens up my voice. You can hear the difference just in the way I was talking and the way I'm sounding now. You're trying to get everything to come out of here along with your mouth, and to actually project. You're wanting to project your voice to say, see the 500 people. If you didn't have a microphone, you want to be heard. So you got to get your voice going in a direction. Bass doesn't have a direction. So you have to create a tone that actually projects that to where everybody can hear what you're saying. The biggest compliment I get from people is I can hear you. You sound the same up here in your high stuff as you sound down in your low stuff. It's all just projecting. And uh, to how to explain that to people, it's kind of hard. It's tough. Um, but it's something like most of the time when I work with bass singers, I show them, I show them how to get the tone placement. And there's stupid little little funny things you can do, you know, like the word green. You hold on to the he he he. You're wanting to point all your vowels like a e i o u u. You open it up, get those tones going, and it allows you to learn how to sing in that that tone placement to where anybody can understand what you're saying. And most of the time they get down this low thing and they're going, you know, they don't have no business doing that. In my opinion, uh, you, you get down there and you sound like a squeak of a door or something like that. That's, I mean, I don't say quit trying, but, uh, but make sure it sounds good. You know, I mean, I'm sure I did it when I screamed, you know, I tried everything, you know, I could listen back to some recordings. I was terrible. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to show people how to do it. And maybe I get on about a thousand different things, but, but it's all about, it's all about placing your tones through your smile and your eyes, open it up, let those smiles, those smiles when you're singing project, you know, if you're singing down here like this, you're not going, you're going to sing out of here and it ain't going to really cut through. But you want to get it up in here to where it's just projecting. You come up, first of all, you start from your stomach. In my opinion, everybody has different opinions about it. 
but it's almost like I said, you know, that feeling when you're doing a sit up and you're trying to reach the top of your abs right there, build up those lungs and get plenty of air and push from that top of that diaphragm, that the abs right there and get it out with a smile like that. And you're trying to, I tell people try to cut glass with it, you know, but you know, but that's, that's my little techniques. Um, I mean, you can sit around, you can, go, you can hum for 10 minutes through your nose and then open up and let it, let it just project and get brighter. Um, there's so many things that you can use, you know, and you learn it more as you go. Um, and uh, so I'm close to 30 something years of doing this full time. And it's just tech. I'm learning every day. There's not a song we do or word we say on stage that I'm not thinking about making sure my tone placement's all right, you know, and I'm, I'm turning 51 in a couple of weeks and I'm still learning. Never get to the point to where you know it all. But yeah. And that's what, that's something I was actually going to say was that you and I in conversations in the past when we've been talking, you right. that like, you know, I, I don't have it a hundred percent all of the time throughout my whole journey after learning uh, and, and trying to figure out this technique and actually feel like, okay, I got it. Right. So that for the guys that are watching that are like, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. I kind of feel like I got it. And, and, and I'll say too, you know, just keep working at it. But even yeah. if at some point you're kind of like, okay, I feel like I kind of lost it and kind of not, maybe I'm not doing it right or whatever. Right. You know, those fundamentals and those things yeah. that help you get That's there right. um, and stay and stay, you know, like uh, I'm trying to think of an example, like a, a ball player, you know, if his shooting's off or his average is off mm -hmm. or what you know, a lot of times the coach will say hey let's get in the cage and let's work on your fundamentals let me let me take right. a look at, mm -hmm. your, at your steps at your the way you got your arms positioned your swing in right. um let's, let's get back to the fundamentals see if there's something wrong there that maybe you're missing and that's right. what affected your performance and i think that's mm -hmm. the voice you know just making sure we well, i will tell you this i'm i don't I'm not trying to say that I, I taught Matt anything, but I'm going to tell you over the last uh, couple of years, your tone placement has just increased. You got great cut, good. Just talking to you, I can hear the tone placement in there, <laughs> and uh, that's that's pretty cool, man. And the older you get, the better it's going to get. I mean, uh, you know, you're not going to get any prettier. Yeah, <laughs> you sure can sound a lot prettier. If you can, you know, so long. Um, so, so when I, I'm listening to Jeff Chapman um, online or, or whatever, obviously, well, let me say this. When I'm listening to the Kingdom Airs online or new albums or whatever, I always going to fast forward to the song where I hear you come in on a solo or I hear a song and I'm like, okay, I bet he's got a low one on this one. Um, well. Free Chain Gang is one. I think, what what is the note on that? Is that an F or, or low? I don't know. I do I don't really, I don't say that as far as being mean or anything. I have no idea. I mean, I'm just, I, we're in the studio. Arthur said, no. And it's funny that I should say this. No. Arthur in the studio is hilarious. The reason why I say that, because he can't go no lower than this right here. I mean, it, you need to hit this. Like, you need to hit this, you know, and he tries to sing the part up. And, and he gets aggravated with himself. Because he can't hit a low note. I said, should I call Lauren? He can explain it better. Because <laughs> Lauren can, Lauren can sing high and low, you know. And uh, but it's kind of funny. But we get in the studio, and uh, he said, "What do you want to do right here? I wanted to feature you on a low note. What do you want to do?" I said, "What is the note?" He said, "He get his little keyboard and dur, 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 dur. you know it's this." I said, "This?" He said, "No, no, no, no. Go lower. The octave below that." I'm like. Is. you know he's yes so it's um uh, it's one of those things where you got to experiment with it and uh yeah there's some songs i wished i would have never done low you know because it feels so much better live to stay in my yeah. tone placement 
there's notes I've done that were so quick. Excuse me. There's so many notes that I've done, or some of the notes I've done that were so quick, just a little, little pop note. Excuse me. And I know I've got Jeff on the side of my Dollywood cup. Oh, isn't that That's special? Pretty cool. Hey, for while he's taking a break, those of you that Jeff is with a group called the Kingdom Airs, and they perform every season at Dollywood, and That's then. Right time they will uh, go on at maybe a couple months of touring but they predominantly stay there at the park so if you're ever in Tennessee going to Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge area and you decide hey we want to go to Dollywood go ride some roller coasters hang out make yep. sure you see a Kingdom Air show uh, Jeff will blow you away on the low end there's the plug for those that are watching that didn't know yeah. Uh, so yeah a lot of people don't know that Dollywood's open right now they're doing uh they're only allowing, I believe, probably between nine and 10,000 people in the park at one time. So your best bet is to call Dollywood and make a reservation if you're going to be in town because there's so many that will come in uh, because of COVID-19. They're just restricting everything. And uh, we have to wear these infernal things, you know, to, to walk through the park or even go get a bite to eat. Um, but I know it's uh, it's trying to keep the 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 infection down and stuff like that, and uh, we're not allowed to go out and talk with the people really. Uh, and there's a shield in, in between the people at the product table, so uh, Jerry and Chris go out and work the product table, and after we get through, we just have to come backstage and hang out till till the next show, you know. And right, we go get a bite to eat, you know. We have to wear a mask and everything, but backstage we're allowed. We don't have to wear them. It's kind of a mask-free zone back here. But we keep everything cleaned and um, cleaned and sanitized. <laughs> sanitized. So you're yeah, in between so. shows right now. And I know you got to go because you got to start getting ready for the next show. But um, just a couple minutes to, to wrap this thing up. You can go to the yeah. key website to catch up with Jeff. Um, he also has a personal profile on Facebook. I know right. you can check him out there. But just to wrap it up, because uh, I know you got to go, uh, I don't want you to talk out before you got to go out there and sing. Right. Uh, what, if, if you were talking to me, I'm walking up to you, I'm saying, man, I'm just starting out on my bass singing journey. Give me a couple little nuggets to help me as a new guy just starting out on my bass singing journey that you think like, yeah, I think these two things is what I, I would focus on if I were starting out on my journey today. Well, first of all, if you're a singer, um, my number one thing is make sure you keep your, your sinuses open and clean. Um, um, keep, keep blown, keep whatever you got to use, Afrin or, or, um, or good. I, I take a daily regimen. A lot of people say we well, only take allergy medicine when you have allergy issues. Well, for here in Tennessee, we sing outside this year. So I've got to stay, I've got to keep my allergies right i mean because i take a 24-hour uh every morning i take a 24-hour pill for allergies and I, you swap them up every couple of months you know and i uh, also take a like flonase and nasonex and stuff like that to yep. to keep uh, a steroid spray in my nose um and then when i'm stuffy i'll use some afrin to open me up um try not to get addicted to it it's worse than any addiction there is, Afrin is, because you go, you start getting like that, man, I got to open myself up and it opens up. And, um, but the first thing is to keep your sinuses good and clear. The second thing I would say is learn to place your tones out of your throat. Don't sing it out of here. This sounds like my throat. This is the way my throat sounds. But if I go up into my head mask, that's the way to do it. And some of the things you can learn to do that with is actually take you a tissue and just like you would blow your nose, okay? After you blow your nose, try blowing your voice through your nose, okay? Try blowing your voice through your nose. And I, I hate to do this, but you're going to, it'd be like this, <laughs> like that. And basically, because you're going to get snot boogies everywhere, but anyway, uh, you're basically going to try to get your tone placement through here. Oh, yeah. Any bugs? <laughs> right now, you'd be getting it all up in your stash. Yeah, exactly. 
But anyway, I mean, the worst thing in the world to walk out on stage and you got a little hanging thing going on there. That's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> but anyway, but try to learn to place your tones up there. You can do it by learning to blow your nose through, blow your voice through your nose just to learn that tone placement. Because I'm going to tell you, first time you start doing it, you're going to, um, I feel like I got a head cold. No, you're placing your tones into something you've never placed it in. And a lot of these opera singers and great singers learn to sing in the mask. And that's, that has to do with your sinuses. You get it up in there. You're not singing until you know it's like this, but you're, you're actually singing with your voice, using your voice with your tone placement up here in your notes. And it gives a good, clean edge, good voice where you can project each word. I'm not talking about singing to scream or anything like that, but learning to place those tones, that's, that's the most important thing. And uh, there's so many different techniques out there for, for tone placement. Um, but that's, that's what works for me. And when I get ready to go on stage, I pop my ears and just bring in my mind. I have to bring some mindset. Uh, yeah. just to, to project and get it up in there, get it clean and smile, smile to the people because you're an artist and you're painting a picture on every song you sing. So that's why they call us artists, you know, yeah, man. and you're wanting to, you've got to live it and breathe it. You want to, that's what I had to do I, every day. And I know people got tired. I'm going, nah, ha, ha. You know, yeah. like that, trying to get it up in my head. I spent hours a day doing that. And the guys I know got tired over the years with these groups I was with. Um, and I just, I just had to want it more than I wanted my next breath. It's my craft. So I've got to hone my craft. And uh, those are the best words Tim Riley ever told me. And those of you that worry so much about your voice, most of the time, if you think about hitting a B flat on the end of a song, if you think about it too much, you're probably going to miss it. Right. It should become second nature. I'm not talking about hitting a B flat. I'm talking about a C, a D, a B, an A, a G, whatever it is that you're going to end this song with. If you think about it too much, you'll convince yourself you're not going to hit it. Some of the yeah. best advice JD ever gave me was this. He said, son, there's going to be a little man that sits on your shoulder every day and tells you you can't do it. You can't hit that note. You can't do that. You're doubting yourself. Well, tell that little man that you might be able to defeat me, but not why I'm on this stage. This is my stage. That's some of the words JD taught me. And uh, that stuck with me because it's not arrogance, it's confidence. You walk out there, those people pay good money to see you. So you've got to be able to get in their hearts, get in their mind, and just let them know that you're doing the very best you can on stage. Don't doubt yourself. If you can't hit it, quit trying for the now, for right now. Do the best you can. And if you That's do the right. best you can, then nobody can ask you any better of you. That's right, man. Well, Jeff, thank you for sharing today, brother. And uh, appreciate Finally, you. we got to do this, man. <laughs> we finally got to do it. Hey, that's enough. <laughs> have uh, your impersonations. We'll have to visit that another time. But thanks so much, man. I appreciate hey, it. Real quick. Uh, I want to tell you about this. This is hilarious. Uh, yeah, uh, Sunday evening, uh, me and my daughter and uh, her mom and a lot of other members of our family went out to eat. Okay. And this is how quick Chris Farley comes up in my life every time. Okay. I was leaning over to talk to my daughter. Well, the chair leaned. Well, I just fell onto the floor. Okay. And I was like, I, it felt like I fell for 30 minutes, man. I was trying to stop it. It's so it's nice. Go ahead, fall on the floor, and then get up. So I came up like this. I went, whoopsie daisy. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, uh, I'm, I'm stupid. I, I go. And uh, so everybody in the store, everybody in the restaurant laughed. So uh, it was. <laughs> you turned it. You turned it. Embarrassing moment into a moment of humor for folks. Yes, and I think that's what a lot of comedians do. They, that's, that's right. They they laugh at their downfalls, and you got to be able to do that. You laugh at yourself some of the best humor in the world, you know. So that's right, man. Thanks for sharing with us today, guys. If you've enjoyed this, give this video a like. 
Jerry and go check out Jeff and the Kingdom Airs online. Thanks, y'all, for watching. Thank you, Jeff. Love you, man. Good to see you, buddy. Thank you.